beautiful Thursday morning. Even though it's a little rainy here in New York, it's still quite a beautiful morning because we need that rain. It has been a real drought here in New York, and my gardens and lawns and everything have really been suffering. So it's really nice to wake up to a rainy morning, finally. So I am so excited to be here with all of you today. My guest today is going to be Anna Francis Gass. She is the author of the book Heirloom Kitchen, which I am so excited to talk to all of you about because it is a wonderful um, book of collections of beautiful recipes from around the world, um, people that she has met and collected, and it's just wonderful. So I'm really looking forward to Anna coming on and sharing some of those with us and talking about her book and her process, and I'll introduce her in just a little bit. But first, I want to talk to you about some things going on in the world, some things you need to take action with. Um, every day, as you know, the news is just just shocking. Um, so we're not going to talk about politics right now, um, although I do want to ask you all to, if you live in New York, to send a letter to Governor Cuomo. Um, I wrote about this in my newsletter this week. There are three bills sitting on his desk that will address some of the tox- toxins here in our environment. One is the Child Safe Products Act, and that bill requires manufacturers to re- report the presence of various chemicals um, to the Department of Environmental Converse- Converse- I'm sorry, Conservation Um and it also phases out six dangerous chemicals in children's products like asbestos and formaldehyde. So that's a really important one. The other bill is to phase out the brain-harming chemical chlorpyrifos, which we've talked about many times. And this dangerous pesticide is used on fruits and vegetables and nut crops in New York State and the rest of the country. And exposure to chlorpyrifos can... Um, can have negative effects during pregnancy and for young children as well as adults. So, um, you know, but most of the testing has been done on adults, so you can just imagine how it would affect children. And the last bill is to phase out the unnecessary use of toxic chemicals in firefighting foam. And um, that's also a really important one. So, the Natural Resource Defense Council has come up with a really nice letter that you can just sign on to, and the link is on my website. So please um, do your part there. And then the other one was about the, you know, the food advice that we're constantly getting. I mean, this latest article in the New York Times that says the advice we've been given to cut down on meat is not scientifically sound is just... Uh, in my opinion, bull. I just think, um, you know, we're not. We need to cut down on our meat consumption, not only for our health, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but also the environmental impact that the production of industrial meat has on our planet. And that is different, yes, than sustainably raised, grass-fed, pasture-raised meat, which can also can you know help sequester carbon into the ground and take it out of the atmosphere. And so that can be a positive for the greenhouse gases. But the industrial agri- industrial meat production has got to go. And, um, you know, I was talking to a young uh, man the other day and just said, you know, he's interested in going on the keto diet, which is very heavy in proteins. And they do eat fruits and vegetables, but very heavy in protein. Uh, we used to call that the Atkins diet when I was younger. And it's just so important um, for people to follow a healthy diet that is a lifestyle diet, a diet that you can live by every day. These fad diets that come and go just are not something that you can live with long term. We need to really eat a healthy, vegetable-centric diet that um, you can incorporate some different proteins too as long as they're of the highest quality. But there are proteins also in vegetables and we just need to pay attention to our diets. But we can't keep flip-flopping and following the latest yo-yo. You know, I would love to follow 
where the money came from for this latest study. Um, you know, this study came out of the Dalhousie University in Canada. And I went on their website, and, you know, there's a whole listing of how they partner with corporations to do research for them. Yes, they also get take money from nonprofits and government, but they do take money from corporations. So who knows who paid for this study? But unfortunately, our governments don't really have money for these healthy studies. And so most of the studies that are um, being paid for are being paid for like the meat lobbyists or the dairy lobbyists or the frozen pizza lobbyists or the French fry lobbyists, you know, or the pharmaceutical companies or the the biotech companies. They're the ones that have the money. They're the ones that are in a position to profit from the test and the results of the test. So you really just have to be smart about it and not you know, all of a sudden do a flip-flop on your healthy eating diet to say, oh, oh, now I can just, you know, eat all the meat I want because this new diet says I can. Just be mindful. Um, you know, you can find anything on the Internet to back any diet you want to be on. So you really just can't really do that. You really need to know where the studies are coming from and really research it. Um so I just wanted to share that with you because this eat less red meat is just, you know, is what we should be doing. And saying that that's bad advice, I just think is bad advice. So on that note, I would like to share my recipe with you for this week. And I'd also like to tell you about some upcoming events that I think you may be interested in. This weekend is um, the New York Times Food Festival going on in Bryant Park. Tickets are still available, and you can go on to the New York Times Food Festival website to find out what talks are being given. Some things are going on that are free, but most things have a ticket price. Uh, there's food vendors there um, also that you can buy a ticket for and taste a bunch of different food trucks and food um, vendors that will be there. So that should be a fun event. Um, October 16th continues the Climate Wednesdays at the Brooklyn Library. And on October 16th, they'll be talking about smart energy, heating, cooling, and turning the lights on. This is a free event, but you do want to um, RSVP. So you can go to the Brooklyn Library main location at Armory Plaza. Um, on, let's see, October 24th, the Health and Wellness Center of Long Island is having their annual Halloween ball. Food Tank, which is a great nonprofit, they are having their New York City Summit and Gala Dinner on November 1st. Um, that should be quite an event. Um, also, the weekend of November 1st and 3rd, there is a wonderful retreat taking place out on Long Island at Our Lady of Grace Retreat Center. And it is a workshop. It's called Remembering Who You Are and Maximizing Your Potential. And Maria Michael who is a shaman, healer, and Lakota um, ancestor um, medicine woman. She is amazing, and she will be leading the workshop, and it's a full weekend, and you can um, find out more about that also on my website. Uh, the 7th National Farm-Based Education Conference is coming up in Baltimore November 9th through the 13th. That should be a wonderful thing. Um, there's so many, so many events coming up. Please check my website at I Eat Green for more events. And now I would like to share this week's recipe, which is the vegan peach tort. Um, it is a real delicious treat. If you are vegan, um, do check this out. And it is. It can also be made with gluten-free flour instead of regular flour if you want to make it gluten-free as well. So I use three-quarter cup of organic sugar, a half a cup of coconut oil, one cup of organic unbleached flour, one teaspoon baking soda and one teaspoon baking powder, pinch of salt, two tablespoons of ground flaxseed, that I mix with two tablespoons of water and two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar. Just let that sit for a little bit. One teaspoon vanilla. And then I use ten small peaches that were blanched, pitted, and sliced. Um, so you're going to 
and then you want some brown sugar, some juice from half of a lemon, and some cinnamon. And you're going to bring a large pot of water to a boil. Add the peaches and just blanch them for about three minutes. Remove them from the water and transfer them to an ice bath. And this will make peeling the peaches easier. Then you can slice them and put them into a separate mixing bowl. In an electric mixer, you're going to cream the sugar and the coconut oil together until they're fluffy. Add the flaxseed with the apple cider vinegar and water and let that sit. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, we already, I already told you about mixing the flaxseed with the apple cider vinegar and the water. So now you're going to add that mixture into the sugar and coconut oil. Um, mix that up. Then you can add the vanilla. And in the separate bowl, you're going to mix the dry ingredients, the flour, the baking soda, and the baking powder, and the salt. And then you're going to mix that up and then add the dry mixture into the electric mixer and blend that in so that the dry ingredients are mixed in well. Then you're going to spoon that batter into a tart pan that you are go- you know that has a removable bottom. Um, I sprayed the tart pan with a little bit of um, coconut oil spray or canola oil spray. Um, and you spoon the batter into that, and then you're going to place all the cut peaches around the tart pan. And you can make it a nice design, or you can just press it in however you'd like. And then you're going to sprinkle the top lightly with some brown sugar, some lemon juice, and some cinnamon. And you're going to bake it for 50 minutes to an hour, depending on your oven. You're going to remove it and let it cool before removing it from the pan. And then before serving, you can garnish it with a little bit of powdered sugar. And that's it. It's delicious. You can serve it with, you know, uh, a vegan ice cream or, um, you know, whipped cream, or it's really great just by itself. So enjoy that. And now it is my pleasure to introduce to all of you Anna Francis Gass. She grew up in a small town on the Rhode Island shore and moved to New York City to go to school and start a new life in the city. But after working in the corporate world for a while, she decided it really wasn't what she wanted to do. She really wanted to study cooking. and So she left that fast-paced job and entered the French Culinary Institute in Manhattan. And then she found her niche. Um, both as a chef and working in test kitchens. She worked for Whole Foods, Mad Hungry, Martha Stewart Living, um, and some other companies. And then um, she assisted in um, some other cookbooks and on some television shows. And this latest adventure of hers is this Heirloom Kitchen Cookbook, which is just a beautiful collection of heritage recipes, and family stories from tables from around the world. And so, Anna, are you with me? Yes, I am. Thank you so much for joining me today on my show. Um, Absolutely. Your book is just so beautiful. Um, Not just, you know, not just all the recipes and the photos, but just the stories. They're just amazing immigrant immigrant stories and, um, you know, when you read them, you just realize how much of people's life used to be centered around putting food on the table. I mean, we're so spoiled now where we can go and just buy something or even just go to a restaurant and put stuff on the table. But, you know, life was about survival and creating your food, and they put so much time and energy into it, and the stories were just amazing. So I thought maybe we could first start with your story. And you can tell us a little bit about your story and your inspiration behind Heirloom Kitchen. Yeah, so like you mentioned, um, I grew up in Rhode Island. A little bit farther back, I was actually born in Italy. My mother is an Italian immigrant. Um, I have an American father. Um, They met in Italy. Um, I was born, and then we came to the U.S. So I am an American citizen, but my mother um, is an Italian immigrant. So, you know, we moved to Rhode Island, which is where I grew up, and, you know, being that my mother was from another country, our home was a little Italy of sorts. Um, You know, she was constantly uh, cooking the food of her youth, speaking to me in Italian. So, although I was an American kid living in the United States, when I came home, it was very much a feeling and a sentiment of, 
you know, the old country. So, you know, I kind of grew up with this, and it was just my normal. I didn't really think much of it. And, you know, uh, went off to school, went to college, and began creating friendships and relationships with other immigrant children. So first-generation kids that had immigrant parents that, regardless of the country their parents immigrated from, had a very similar childhood story to my own. Lots of similarities in how we were raised, remembering um, our culture, honoring our traditions of, you know, the, our, the, ho- the homeland, our, you know, the country of origin. Mm-hmm. So I guess this was always kind of on, you know, in my mind unconsciously as I matured. I ended up, like you said, I ended up taking a job in business, worked in Manhattan, um, you know, corporate America, so to speak. And then after having two children, I realized I really wanted to do a career change. And that meant kind of following a passion I always had for cooking. I enrolled in the French Culinary Institute in downtown New York. And um, from then on, I worked in food media. So like you mentioned, Food 52, um, Martha Stewart Living in the test kitchen. So I became a professional recipe tester. Any cookbook you buy, most of the recipes you find online from a reputable source, those recipes have, have been tested. So someone like me is getting into the kitchen to make sure that they work so that when you, the user or the reader, takes that recipe um, and runs with it, you're going to have a successful product at the end. Mm-hmm. Very so important. About, yeah, so, <laughs> so about five years ago, um, I realized that, you know, I'm a professional recipe tester, but I don't know how to make my mom's recipes. She always cooked for us, you know, those big Sunday dinners that, you know, you hear about in, you know, the homes of immigrants or even, you know, a lot of true blue Americans that just get together on the weekends and have those family recipes, those family meals that mean so much. I didn't know the ones for my family, and I thought – this is ridiculous. I could do this for a living. These recipes are so cherished. I have children. My sister has children. These are our heirlooms. And that's where Heirloom Kitchen was born, was getting my mother's meatballs recipes down, you know, how she makes her sauce, how she makes her homemade pasta. Mm-hmm. Once I finished up with my mom, I thought, wow, this is really great. I could provide a service to my friends. Um, an email went out, and I said, look, you know, Give me those recipes. Let me get into the kitchen with your mother, and I will get you these recipes written down, standard form, and you'll never lose those cherished recipes of our parents, of our grandparents. It spread like uh-huh. wildflower, wildflower, excuse me. I went from kitchen to kitchen. Um, two years ago, I ended up with a book deal for HarperCollins. Heirloom Kitchen, the cookbook, was born. I ended up cooking with almost 40 women representing 35 different countries around the globe. And the criteria was that you were a woman, that you immigrated to this country, and that you continued cooking the foods of your homeland. So that's, mm-hmm. that's the book. Wow. And it's such a beautiful book. Um, I really have enjoyed perusing through it. You know, one of the things that strikes me that's so amazing is how so many cultures have a similar have a similar recipe, you know, whether it's, um, you know, um, empanadas, samosas, rice balls, you know, like, like filled, filled pastries of some sort. Right? Absolutely. Um, absolutely. I'm, I, I always joke, every, every country has a dumpling, you know, like Italians, right. the, <laughs> right. ravioli, the Polish have the pierogies, the Chinese have, you know, gyoza, uh, the Japanese have the gyoza, the Chinese have the, the traditional dumpling, um, the empanadas. But what I, you know, what I really found doing this project, which is something I guess, you know, we should all kind of acknowledge, is that, you know, borders are arbitrary. People move around, and, and when people move, it's not just body, bodies moving from one place to another. They're bringing with them their art, their music, their food, their culture, their traditions. And whether we like it or not, we start mixing together. We're influenced, and it's a good thing. <laughs> it's a really good thing. Um, or at least that's my, you know, humble opinion. The, 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 the United States is the beautiful melting pot that it is because all these people came here and, and they became American and they're very proud to be American and they adopted American traditions, but they simultaneously held on to who they are as people. 
And that's why, like you mentioned, a lot of the food in my book, you can go to a restaurant and get it because someone came here, opened up a little, you know, mom and pop shop and continued cooking that food and introduced it to us, you know, or the Mm -hmm. people that were, you know, already here. Um, You know, the Irish, the Italians, and, you know, now we have the Mexicans, the Syrians. Everyone came here. And, and, and kind of put their spoon in the pot, in the pot right? Um, and another thing I did in the book, if you, you know, you do buy it, is that you'll see I included everyone's story, their immigration story, why they came here. Um, I really wanted to celebrate the, the immigration process, women coming here, and why they came here, how it was not easy for everyone to come And, you know, it's funny because I feel like now we act like immigration is a new thing and we forget that people have been immigrating here since the 1800s. You know, I mean, Mm -hmm. unless you're part of an Indian tribe, um, you know, and you're, you know, you, you, your, your, your roots are in the U.S., everyone came from somewhere else, good, bad, or indifferent. They were brought here either by good conditions, bad conditions, their own volition or not. We all came here. It was a new land at some point for someone in our family. And I want to celebrate that because so many good things came from that. And, um, you know, this book, there, there's no political um, undertone. This book was started five years ago. I never knew we'd be in this position that we are now. But I'm proud that this book is hopefully um, providing a celebratory tone to all of us being together here in the U.S., and also, like you said, kind of celebrating our similarities as opposed to our differences. Right, right, absolutely. It was interesting. I was at an event not that long ago, actually just a few weeks ago, and Lydia Bastinich was there telling her immigrant story because she just came out with her immigrant story book. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, everyone thinks of her as Italian, but the reality is she grew up in, you know, when you say borders are arbitrary, she grew up in actually Yugoslavia. I mean, she was living during World War II. They came and made a border right through the town where she was living, you know, and some of her family was in Italy. Some of her family got stuck in Yugoslavia, and she was in Yugoslavia with her grandparents. So, you know, you know the food that she knew one would call Italian, but... That's not really where she grew up, right? You right. know, so it's it's very interesting, um, and you know, I've traveled a lot, and you know, trying to sample foods from around the world. I mean, that is, you know, that is one of my passions. You know, going places and tasting foods from that are traditional, and you know, we can do that right here in our country. So, putting all these together is really wonderful. So um, so you wrote the recipes and the stories, and so did you find the women that you wrote about mostly through just sending out that email, through networking with the people that you already knew? Yes. I mean, this was a really organic process. It started with my friends from NYU because, like I said, I think I was unconsciously drawn to people with immigrant parents. Um, so I just had an, a natural network of people that ha- you know, were first generation, and then once I started kind of reaching the end of my friends, you know, I, one kitchen kind of landed me into the next where a woman would say, oh, you need to cook with my friend from Iraq because she makes the best tabbouleh and you need to get in her kitchen. And she would call her while I was cooking and help me set up that next appointment because once I explained to these women what I was doing, um, you know, it, it just became very clear that – they also found it was important to keep these traditions alive for their family, get these written recipes written down, and, and, and the fact that none of them really had written them down. Right, right. A little pinch of this, a little a handful of that, you know, and you actually have to, when you're creating a recipe, you had to measure that. Is that right? Because I know you actually created the recipes. I mean, you worked with them in the kitchen, but... Like you said, they hadn't written them down. So what did you do? Did you, you know, add up all those pinches of salt that they were adding? And That's exactly you, what I did. A pinch became a teaspoon. A handful became a cup. 
Um, you know, I, I would bring everything I needed, weight, um, you know, a, a measuring cup, uh, you know, a, a scale, whatever I needed. And I'd say, okay, let's take that handful that you always add and why don't you empty it out before we put it into the bowl, into a measuring cup, and let's see how much you're really adding. Um, you know, because their, their process was the same every time. They actually did have a cohesive recipe in their head. They just didn't know it. And I was the one that just drew it out of them and get it, got it on a piece of paper. So the reality is this is their recipe. I'm just the one that kind of get, got it on paper for them so that the future generations of their family and hopefully the readers of this cookbook can also enjoy them. Mm-hmm. Um, so obviously, you know, you shared your mother's recipes. Um, which are some of your favorites? I mean, obviously, I guess the ones that you put into your book are your favorite. Um, yeah, I mean, those are, you know, every family kind of has the recipes that they all go back to. Um, and what I said to, you know, the kids before, you know, I, I ended up meeting with the mothers was when you were in college and you were, knew you were coming home for a weekend, what were the recipes that you called home and said, Ma, I want this on the table when I get home? You know, because mm-hmm. we all do that. Mom, I'm coming home for the weekend. I'm sick of this dorm food. Please, please, please make your meatballs, you know. Um, and when I said that, people would smile. And um, they'd know exactly, immediately, they'd know exactly what they wanted in the book. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Very cool. So when you were making them, what was one of your favorites? You know, it's so funny. People always ask me that, but... You know, what's so nice about the cookbook is there's something for everyone. This isn't one cuisine. It's every cuisine. So you buy this cookbook, and it's an international Rolodex. So for me, my favorite is always what I'm craving that night. You know when you get home late and you're like, oh, my God, all I want is some Chinese food, and you pick up the phone, and you, you order it. Well, what I'm hoping is that when you're having that craving for Chinese food, you open up my cookbook because there's a whole section of both northern and southern Chinese cuisine that you can reach for. Same thing if you're creating Mexican, Italian. So my favorite in the book is pretty much everything. It's just dependent on what I'm craving that particular evening. Um, Mm -hmm. And I've really enjoyed trying food from all over the globe, foods that I knew, you know, like Cuban black And then other foods that I had never heard of before, but, you know, were equally delicious. And people of that ethnicity very much enjoy those foods. So, for example, um, the Dominican woman taught me how to make sancocho, which is actually a very popular dish in a lot of Latin America. And it's it's kind of an all-in-the-pot dish. Um, It's a big stew. It's got pork. It's got chicken. It's got ears of corn. And, you know, these people make these big, a big, big part of it when they're having a party because there's something for everyone. And Mm -hmm. if you say Sancocho to someone from the Dominican, they know exactly what you're talking about. Right, right. You know, for me, I eat mostly vegetarian. I do eat some fish. So for me, I've been going through the book and trying to remake some of these recipes vegetarian. And that's one of my favorite things to do is, you know, you know, I've made your mom's rice balls, you know, and I, you know. Yeah, you just take out the, you can take out the, the prosciutto. Um, if, if one re- vegetarian dish in the book that I love, I hope you try, is the eggplant patties. I don't know if you like eggplant. I am I telling you, when you eat those patties, you swear that there's meat in them. They are so savory and flavorful, and they have such a bite, an, an umami bite. When I ate them, uh-huh. I watched her make them. I said, wait a minute, there has to be ground meat in this. And it's like, no, I just made them. There's no meat in them. Those are delicious. Right. Um, and the thing, the thing that surprised me about that recipe was she boiled the eggplant. I've never boiled eggplant before. What happens when you boil it is it just gets so soft and creamy. Right. So that then when you fry it in the skillet, the outside gets so um, crispy and crunchy and the inside, you know, still kind of has that creaminess to it with the cheese and the Mm -hmm. garlic. Um, Oh my God, I'm like craving it right now. It's so good. Right. Right. Um, It's better than any veggie burger I've ever had. Um, Absolutely love it. Yeah. Um, And then, uh, you know, obviously the tabbouleh, the hummus, 
the apple pancakes, um, you know, even the borscht. Oh, uh, about the apple pancakes. Borscht. So I'm going to mm. stop you there for a minute because the thing I love about the apple pancakes, um, I have that pan. I call that pan my Munka pan because mm-hmm. um, uh, my a friend of mine's grandmother used to make these Swedish pancakes in a pan like yeah. this, and they called them Munkas. And yeah, or evil so A lot of people know them as evil sleevers. What do they call them? Evil sleevers. There, it's a, they, That's actually the name of the the pan. And absolutely, it's it's a it's like it's almost like a donut, right? It's like that that, that circle. Um, right. And yeah, so yeah, so the German have a version. Um, the the Swedish have a version. The Tell Swedish, me the name of the pan again. Them. Evil what? Evil Squeavers. You can find it. It's funny. I actually bought the pan on Amazon. So for people that are listening, it's 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 a it's a small pan. It's cast iron, and it has um, half spheres in it. So you put you pour the dough into these tiny little holes, and then it, the dough rises up, and then you flip them. And this right. woman's grandmother actually used to use knitting needles to flip. <laughs> uh huh. Little, yeah. I've used my chopsticks. So, yep. Uh huh. Yeah, you can use chopsticks. She used her knitting needle. Uh, they even sell, they they even sell turn. They call them turning, um, turning uh, wands. You can actually get them online as well because you can uh-huh. get everything online. Right. Um, right. Well, but, yeah, you know, I was ask I was going to ask you even about some of the ingredients because some of the ingredients are not your normal ingredients, but I know you can get them online. Like in, um, I think it was your mother's recipe, vanilla yeast. I've never seen vanilla yeast in any of my markets. Um, yeah, or vanilla and, and the powder reality even. is, and, and the thing is, so about 99% of the recipes in, in the book have stuff that you can get at your local grocery store. It was, you know, these women came to this country. They, they weren't going online to buy things. You know, the biggest concern when people see an international cookbook is, oh, no, I'm going to ha- see a million ingredients that I don't know. The one lovely thing about local grocery stores nowadays is there's very robust, you know, Latin sections, um, Italian sections, Chinese sections. So you should be able to find almost everything in your local grocery store. If you, you know, don't want to get vanilla yeast just because it adds that little bit of vanilla flavor, you can just use regular yeast. But it is so simple to find online or in like in a little Italian specialty shop if you have one in your town. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, Amazon sells it um, if you want to get on Amazon. But no, a lot of this stuff you can just get right at the local grocery store. And you could also probably just use regular yeast and then add a little bit of vanilla extract, no? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a little scary sometimes, I know. Um, I'm, a, I'm much more of a cook than a baker. So mm-hmm. baking is, you know, so much more of a um, a science, and you know, you can really mess it up. Where cooking is much more flexible, <laughs> and you can kind of flow with it a little more. So sometimes it's a little I trickier agree. to I substitute. Agree. Yes, right, right. Um, Anna, let's take a couple minute break, and when we come back, I want to talk to you about. A little bit more about the book. Um, I know you use Andrew Scrivani as your uh, food photographer. I want to talk about that. So everyone listening, don't go anywhere. I'm talking with Anna Francis Gass about her new book, Heirloom Kitchen. Be right back. Welcome to Politics Done Right. I am your host, Egberto Williams. This is the progressive program that will take the mystery out of politics. This is the program that will encourage you to make sure government becomes we the people. Whether you are liberal, conservative, or otherwise, you get to air your point of view. Right here, every Monday on the Progressive Radio Network. Economic, political, and military decisions in Washington, D.C. impact the entire United States and world. And yet corporate media offers few facts, history, or people's voices about these important issues impacting our lives. 
I'm Esther Iverm, inviting you to check out On the Ground, Voices of Resistance from the nation's capital on the Progressive Radio Network, Mondays at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. We cover social justice activists in the streets and in the suites. We cover those who come to D.C. from across the nation or from across the world to speak truth to power. Whether it's the war machine, the movement for black lives, health care, education, the economy, voting, corporate power, immigration, criminal justice, or environmental justice. Check out On the Ground, Voices of Resistance from the nation's capital, Monday, 6 p.m., here on the Progressive Radio Network. I'm Celia Farber. And I'm Christina Borgson. We're the hosts of a brand new show, The Whistleblower Newsroom, right here on PRN. This is a show for and about whistleblowers, and by us. Two investigative reporters brutally hammered for uncovering cover-ups and media corruption. This show is for whistleblowers who stand up for the truth and face devastating consequences, who document facts and risk their lives and livelihoods to bring those facts to the public. They come from all walks of life, government, science, journalism, academia, and many other fields. They'll be safe, warm, and welcome here on the Whistleblower Newsroom every Friday morning, 10 a.m., right here on PRN. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. You're listening to Bavani at IE Green on the Progressive Radio Network, and I'm here with my guest, Anna Francis Gass, and her new book, Heirloom Kitchen. For those of you that are just joining us, um, I was just talking about the photographs in the book, which are so beautiful. Um, Can you talk to us a little bit about the photographs and the photographer, Andrew Scrivani, who is actually a food writer for the New York Times and other publications as well. Um, can you talk to us about how you got him to work with you and the process? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Andrew was, is kind of a friend of a friend. He is a food photographer for the New York Times. You can see his beautiful photography every week. Uh, in the food section um, and online. And, you know, she just said, I think he'd really love this project, and, you know, his photography is stunning. So we connected. He fell in love with the project. It touched his heart. He's, um, you know, he, his grandparents on both sides came over here from Italy. So he very much understood the Sunday dinners and the need to preserve and he just really enjoyed what I was doing, and he signed on. We photographed all the women. Andrew um, agreed to do that because I really wanted to make the contributors of this book special. They were feel special. They really put their heart and soul into this project with me. They were so transparent with their recipes, with their stories. I mean, this is personal information that they just handed to me and said, you know, just make a beautiful book. So when it came time to publish, I wanted them to truly feel like this was going to be an heirloom for their families as well. Mm-hmm. And I think I accomplished that with this book. And, uh, yeah, so Andrew, I say to people, even if you just look at the book for the, the, the photography, it's worth it. I mean, every shot is just completely gorgeous. And then, you know, he made the women um, look so regal, and uh, I just was incredibly proud of the final product of this book. Yeah, the photographs are gorgeous, absolutely. Thank you. Um, and, you know, and that you got him to work with you on the project is really wonderful. And so how much um, creative control did you have of the book, and how much did, um, did the publisher... Have. You know the pu- the publisher at the end of the day, they you know it's their it's their brand, so they really so run the show. But what I found with Harper Collins was they really allowed me to have equal, if not more, say in how this book came out. I touched every page. I 
organized. I, you know, another thing in the book, if you, if you do take a look at it, is there's a lot of ephemera from these women. We photographed passports and old, old recipes scrawled on a piece of paper by the mother hurriedly before they, you know, they got on the plane to come. Um, old pieces of jewelry that meant a lot different things that they, they, they brought over from their countries to feel a sense of home. So that's sprinkled throughout the book. So I wanted to really showcase everything, and we did in a very organized way. Um, every page has something special to look at. This book, absolutely, you will find it in the cookbook section. Uh, section of you know your local bookstore but to me I really felt like it was it was an immigrant anthology it, it, it's it's showing where these women are from why they came and they allowed me to have my vision come out in the way that I wanted it to so I had a lot of control uh, you know a lot of people say they had they had they just kind of had to hand their thing over and it was such a collaborative process and I dealt with incredibly, incredibly talented people on all sides. The book designer, Laura Polisi, who put in all those different recipes and photos with, she puts like little pieces of tape to make it look almost like a scrapbook. Um, a lot of care went into this book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can see that. You can see that. Um, you know, we talked about how many countries have recipes that are like a dumpling, pierogi, ravioli. Same goes for pancakes, right? Everyone has yeah. a crepe, a pancake, a blintz, a dosa. Um, can you share with, you know, any surprises that you came across when you were collecting these recipes? I'm sure some of these similarities kind of like hit you as well as you were going through them going, wow, that looks just like a blintz. And it's a dosa, yeah, you know, for, it's from India and one yeah. from, you know. Yeah, I mean, you know, stuffed, filled, you know, um, this is comfort food, you know, so if you're on a diet, I don't suggest cracking this book open because you're going to break your diet. But, you know, this is, this is the, the stuff that warms the belly, lines the ribs. This is what, you know, made us feel at home. There's a reason it's called comfort food. It's comforting. It's the food of our grandparents. It's the food of, you know, our, our lineage, our generations that came before us. And, you know, like you were mentioning before, this isn't about, like, some fad diet, you know. It was about the foods that were available. You know, there's nothing fancy. There's no fancy techniques. All the women cooked with, you know, a bowl and a spoon, you know. There wasn't a lot of heavy machinery used in this project, you know. Um, And that's why I said in my introduction that I really found America at the bottom of a mixing bowl because every one of these recipes almost starts with a mixing bowl, and a wooden spoon. Some of the wooden spoons were from back from the old country that they've been right, literally right. mixing with for 40 years, and they still pick it up to mix with. So my hope is just that you open it up, and like I said before, you just realize that, you know, on the outside, of course, we all look different, we have different accents, and, you know, different religions, different belief systems, of course. We're not all cut from the same cloth, but at the same time, when you look at, what we're all here for, you know, and I always say, you know, we all love our mothers, we all love our children, and we all love our country. And if you kind of start with that, you realize that, you know, our, my home is, 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 is a lot like yours. And that's what I really found. Every woman I cooked with, I felt like I was standing next to my own mother. And that was really right. special for me. And um, I think that when you, when you fear something because you don't know it, but you get up close, you realize there's nothing really to fear at all. Right, right. And the other thing that comes out really strong in the book is the love in all of these recipes. You know, it's like so many of the recipes that I cook, you know, are for healthy eating. And, you know, I I also cook for people who are ill. And so some of the recipes are, you know, that I cook are, you know, really um, very clean and medicinal. But I think also... When you are cooking recipes that are comfort foods that are filled and they're being made with love in the kitchen, that there's an energy in that food, and and that love energy is healing in itself, and that you absolutely. can't just I'm, you absolutely. can't disregard that. I think it's you know it's like yes you can get you know order a, 
a healthy miso soup from a Japanese restaurant and have it delivered, but it's not going to be the same. It's not going to have the same absolutely. nutritional value as something that's made. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think it's the unwritten ingredient in every one of these recipes is love. Um, you know, if you if you read the the, the story of the woman from um, from the Ukraine that immigrated over here, she was so her biggest concern was not, you know, she was a doctor. It wasn't the fact that she'd have to retake her boards, you know, essentially, her, you know, redo her medical licensing. All to, 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 It wasn't about career. It was about when I get there, when I get to Queens, this place I don't know, are they going to have the ingredients that I need to make my borscht? Because that that's her lifeline to her children. That's what keeps her kids fed in the winter. Um and, yeah, I think when you, I mean, I come from, obviously, a long line of cooks. My mother was a cook. Two of my aunts own restaurants. Um, my grandmother was an excellent cook. Um, but I, I tell people all the time, even if you aren't really good at cooking, making something for your family. I mean, I cook every night for my kids. I know that's ambitious. But even a couple of weeks, get into the kitchen, make something, because I'm telling you, they will eat it because there is that un unwritten ingredient of love and they will feel it and they will remember it and you know when you're old and gray um and tired they're still going to say mom could you make me that because that right. reminds them of their childhood and reminds them of you and of course i'm all for healthy eating and clean eating um i do that 90 percent of the time but sunday right. dinners are sacred and special and that's the time that we sit down and we eat the foods that I remember watching my grandmother make in her kitchen back in Calabria, Italy, that her mother made, and it just teaches my kids not only that I love them, but a little piece of who they are. Right, right. Beautiful. Well, the whole book's beautiful. Now, the cover shot are your mother's hands, right? Can you tell yes. the story about that shot? Yes, so that's tagliatelle, which in Italian means cut pasta, um, and it's a pasta that you cut by hands. You don't use a machine. You roll out the dough, then you roll it up into, like, a tight spool, and you cut it out, and then you end up with these beautiful ribbons of pasta. And the reason it was so important for that to be the cover shot is because when I did visit my grandmother in Italy, I saw her make that pasta. And it was this incredible tether that was created for me, that I had seen my mother make it in, in, in Rhode Island in her kitchen. I went to Italy and saw my grandmother make it and hear the story of how her mother taught her how to make it. And for me, that those hands, my mother's hands, cutting that pasta is such a vivid childhood memory for me. And it just, for me, completely came full circle with this book of getting my mother's recipes written down, getting the recipes of all these people written down, and then all the way back to me, I created kind of this circle of heritage recipes, family stories, and, and the heirlooms that we pass on that to me are much more sacred than, you know, a painting or, you know, Aunt Dottie's ring or whatever it might be um, that gets passed down to you in a will. Yeah. You know, and, and it's actually, as you're saying that, it, I'm thinking it, it's sad. It's like I don't really have, you know, I, I've been cooking my whole life, but my cooking came out of actually since I was 16 when I decided to stop eating meat. And my mother said, all right, you're on your own. You know, and she right. didn't, she stopped cooking. But my mother was not a cook. She was a woman of the 50s, and she, you know, you know, was thrilled when minute rice came out, instant mashed potatoes, canned yes. vegetables. yes. Um, I mean, when I first learned to cook, I, you know, I tell this story a lot, and I'm sure people on on my show have heard me say this before. When I got my first wok, I opened a can of veg oil, which is a can of mixed vegetables, and I put yep, that yep. into the wok begin to stir fry them because I had never seen a real vegetable in my house other than, you know, the stuff for making salad, like iceberg lettuce and carrots and cucumbers. Right, cucumber. right. So, um you know, I had a long way to go <laughs> to learn to cook. Yeah, I mean, and, look, this is not everyone's experience, and that's totally fine. I just think that even if, you know, that wasn't your experience growing up and you just appreciate, you know, a good a good pot of soup or, you know, a well-made meatball, um, there's something for everyone. And, and another piece of of just kind of praise that I get is when someone says, you know what, I'm not a cook at all. I'll never make anything in this book, but I still bought it because I loved the stories. I read it like a book from cover to cover. 
um, and uh, I just enjoyed the, the thesis of it. And that, that was nice, too, you know, for the non-cook that just really loves hearing people's stories. Yeah, yeah. So as a mother of young children, what are your kids' favorites? What do you like to make for them? You know, they, they love everything in the book, too, because they've tried everything now three or four times with all the recipe testing. But, yeah, the uh-huh. apple pancakes are definitely a big hit. You know, we shower them with a whole bunch of powdered sugar. They're delicious. Um, the, um, the, the, the arroz con pollo, which is a simple chicken and rice dish that the woman from Panama taught me, it's got, you know, all your, like, yummy Goya spice blends, like, you know, Sazon, and, 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 and makes chicken really savory. Then you throw in some rice and some olives, and that's delicious. Um, another big favorite for them are the sweet, is the Swedish palachenka torta, which is basically pancakes all layered on top of each other and, again, showered with powdered, powdered sugar. So there's just so many family favorites in there, stuff for kids, stuff for adults. It truly is. It's over 100 recipes. Um, don't be intimidated. That's, it's international. The ingredients are all at your fingertips. I shopped 99% of this book in my local grocery store, and I don't have a great local grocery store. So um, mm-hmm. I just encourage people to, to get in there and try the stuff that looks good to them. Yeah. And for you know my listeners who, you know, many of my listeners are uh, more plant-based, vegetarian eaters, there's so much in here, and it's so easy to adapt the recipes. Like I was saying, I mean, obviously, you know, if you, you know, grilled short, <laughs> grilled beef short ribs, you might skip over that one because you're not going to make it vegetarian. But, you know, most of the recipes, like even the chicken con- arroz con polla, you know, you can make that instead of the chicken. You can use a tofu or a tempeh or something, but still oh, you the flavoring can. and the yeah. spices and all of that can be adapted to be plant based. Yes. So people Even can my really mom's tomato sauce is not has no meat in it. I mean you can obviously drop the meatballs into it, but if you just want to make my mom's tomato sauce, I mean the fact that she simmers the basil ahead of time in the in the garlic, um, it's a fantastic sauce. Any vegetarian would absolutely love it. Um, and you know, a lot of these women did not eat a lot of meat growing up. So um, there's just so many different things in the book that you can have that don't require um, don't require meat. I mean, you can make the Persian tadig, which is such a delicious rice dish. And um, there's Even just the, so the much. glass there's, noodle stir fry is perfect. I mean, it has a half a oh, pound of, pay, yeah. of beef in it, but everything else is vegetarian, vegetable. And, and everyone a who's a vegetarian knows vegetable. you can put Absolutely. in tofu or tempeh or seitan or, you know, yeah, or just and that's beans. The same you thing can even with add. The, uh, bulgogi, uh, the, the, the Korean bulgogi. It's got a nice fried egg on top, so you get your protein. And yeah, you just can omit the, um, the steak strips because all right. the vegetables get fried out. You put it on a nice heaping pile of rice with that beautiful fried egg on top. I mean, that is a great vegetarian meal. You're getting all your veggies. You're getting the fat and the protein from the egg. And then you're getting, you could do white rice or brown rice for your starch. So it's a win-win. Yeah. So there's so much flexibility, possibilities in here, but you got the, you can get the flavors of those, um, of those cultures by following the recipes. And, um, I've just enjoyed it so much, and what a great project, and what fun you must have had doing it. Um, I did, I did. Yeah, really great. So, you know, now that the book's behind you, what what are your plans going forward? Um, you plan, yeah, you have another I mean, book in mind? I'm sure there's funny, another hundred everyone, women. I know, everyone's <laughs> always asking me, you know. So I feel like this is Act 1, and I'm still kind of in the play. Um, you know, we haven't gone to intermission just yet. I'm still very much promoting the book. I'm out there enjoying it. Um, I'm hoping many, many people buy it for holiday presents because I think it's the perfect gift for, you know, the cook in your life. And then, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, I, I do a lot of videos on Instagram. Um, I'd love to continue just by d- developing my digital platform. I just really want to get people in the kitchen and remembering their grandma recipes. So I have a new series um, called My Mama Makes It Better. We have people submitting in recipes, and uh, we're making not just immigrant recipes, but just amazing recipes of people from all over the country that are proud of their heritage or just simply something that their grandmother used to make for them. 
Uh huh. And the my mama makes it better is what on a Facebook page or Instagram? It's Instagram. It's Instagram. through Fine Cooking Magazine. Our actually first episode is this Friday, and uh, my Instagram is at Anna F Goss G A S S. So you can check me out, and then you, that will link over to also the episodes. And yeah, I'm just. This is, this is kind of my mission, getting people in the kitchen, remembering our, our, our family recipes and uh, getting them written down before, you know, that person might no longer be able to cook it or no longer around to teach us. So um, that's kind of where I'm at right now, and we'll see, we'll see what the future brings. I try to, I try to live in the now, as, as hard as that is, but enjoy what's yeah. going on. Proud of the book, and I just, I'm just excited that it's, it's out in the beautiful. world. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. You should be proud of it. Thank you so much, Anna, for joining us. Thank you for sharing your passion with all of us and bringing these beautiful recipes to life for you know all of the children of the the mothers and grandmothers that wrote them, and for all of us who um, you know get to enjoy them. So thank you so much, Anna, for joining us. For those of you just ca- catching us, this is Anna Francis Gass, whose new book. Heirloom Kitchen is a real joy, and you've been listening to Bhavani at IE Green on the Progressive Radio Network. See you all again next week. Thanks again, Anna, and have a great rest of the week. Bye for now. Thank you so much.